concerns about anything except the weather. Don't want any more politics. <laughs> politics and weather are out. I have a question. Yes, sir. How come there's all this extra room in the visitor center? How come we don't have more displays up here? Well, that was uh, the agreement that was reached when the building was built uh, with the Gettysburg Foundation. They designed the museum and we designed the museum around the specific artifacts to tell the story. So X amount of artifacts were needed for the displays and consequently the rest is in storage. You can it's almost like agree with that concept or not, which some of us maybe not totally agree with. Yes. How often do they switch it or not? There we go. The museum portion, uh, since the exhibits are designed around the artifacts, there's not going to be any room to change the museum itself. Although we have a few temporary displays and things where we can rotate some of our items in. According to Mr. Griddell, who is our uh, <coughs> chief curator. Yes. Yes, I, you explained that they are in storage. So are they storage in this side or another side? They're in the basement of this building. Oh, okay. Yes, we have. Uh, Large and small, over uh, 60,000 artifacts in our collection. All the time. All the time. And uh, yes, uh, Greg Adele gets a lot of requests. And of course, since in the museum portion, we're very understaffed. Uh, totally at the whole park we're understaffed, but particularly the museum collection. Uh, only once in a while, if that researcher has some, uh, wants to uh, uh, rediscover or un undiscover some kind of mystery or something that our artifacts can unlock, then, then he'll let them go in. But just, I want to look at a great coat. Well, you can look at a great coat this afternoon. So, yeah, um, because of the amount of staff, we all the requests we can't accommodate everybody, just be impossible. So, you know, there are a lot of people who, oh, I'd love, like to see and get the dimensions of a Civil War Kepi. I want to measure one of your originals. Well, you can you can look that up online. You can. You don't need to have an original in front of you that you'll measure, so, yeah. Do they have like, a, like an online, uh, something that says what the has all that organized? Well, you, know, you, you know, it'd be nice to have an <laughs> online museum. That would, that takes a lot of money in the budget, so. Uh, don't think that's gonna happen, but uh, yeah, that would be, uh, that would be something I thought about that do a virtual tour through our museum and with select objects. Uh, right now we're stuck with this every year, but uh, hopefully this will give you a little taste anyway. Got a question, sir? My question was related. It sounds like a summer intern project to me. Yeah, yeah. Lowly unpaid interns do a lot of work for us, that's for sure. Yes, sir. Do your artifacts and storage travel to other museums at any other time? Uh, no, on occasion we'll lend them to another uh, federal <coughs> facility, uh, but uh, most of them, over 60,000 of them, are right in this building. Uh, temperature controls, humidity <coughs> controls, environmental <coughs> things are all taken care of, so they have a nice, safe place to rest. Public agreement to swap back and forth or you know, I just do you know, you know, you know, you know. no, we don't. 
I don't think we have a formal agreement. Uh, if uh, on occasion uh, um, a privately run or public museum, something up like in Harrisburg, requests something, then we have to look at it and see if that would fit us and fit them. And maybe we can put it on temporary loan to them or something. Uh, Greg Goodell, the curator, knows a whole lot more about those uh, that kind of stuff than I do, believe me. So, so I think that's how it works. Yes? Uh, actually, both of those questions. I've been in this uh, same museum. We're from Harrisburg. And every now and again, they actually open up the archives. Look at the proof. But do you guys do, do that or consider that? Um, Oh, a few years ago when we had a little more staff, we would we would open up for uh, some of the friends of the, the national parks here. Uh, we'd have an afternoon. All the people could come in, yeah, you know, in groups of, you know, eight to ten people and look at some of the things that we had set up in, in the collection <coughs> area. But uh, just an open, open door. Uh, if we had the staff, we might have been able to do that. The staff, uh, the museum staff here at Gettysburg consists of Greg Goodell, <coughs> our uh, chief curator, and a, uh, another employee by the name of Jennifer Weaver. Jennifer has actually uh, uh, brought these out from the collection for us uh, this afternoon. That is the staff in our museum, two people. So it's kind of impossible to do a lot of stuff with, with that few people. Sometimes it's, uh, it's very nice that over the years they've allowed uh, me to come down, select certain items, and bring them out of the collection, uh, which is uh, a marvelous thing, and especially with the limited amount of staff and the hours they spend doing other things, cataloging and things like that. So it's, it's uh, pretty nice of them. Thank Jennifer uh, Weaver for this all together. I'd also like to thank uh, John Heiser. Uh, John Heiser uh, puts together the PowerPoint, helps a lot on these programs if these things could talk. So, John, if you're out there, thank you very much. John's going to be retiring this year after 40 years in the Park Service. So, some of you probably saw his lecture earlier this year on the Army Mule. He's, uh, I like to say he's got so much Gettysburg institutional knowledge about the park and the history of the park that uh, he's indispensable. And uh, many of us will certainly miss him when he, when he retires. But he threatened to come back every once in a while to keep us on the up and up. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see him again. <coughs> Of course, you met Phil Brown. He sets up all the audio and stuff like that. I don't know how to work these modern things. So <laughs> Phil Brown is essential in getting this whole thing up and running. So. Yes, sir. What's happening with the Little Round Top rehabilitation and what's involved? Oh, boy. Um, a lot more than above my pay grade, um, what I would do is I would get a hold of uh, our public affairs officer. Uh, his name is Jason Martz, M-A-T-Z, uh, M-A-R-T-Z, and he can go into a lot more detail. I know we did a we renovation plan, we're doing trail plans, we're parking plans, it's quite extensive. But like I said, uh, it's way above my pay grade. To give, to give you a really definitive answer. And I don't want to say anything that might be wrong. <laughs> Well, I've been, I got in the Park Service in 1987, and uh, I was doing park protection out at Little Fort Laramie, Wyoming, 
just a beautiful little park to work at. And then uh, I got my first permanent position in the Park Service uh, in 88, 89. So uh, I guess you do the math, 30, 31, 32 years. Not all here, no. The lion's share of my career has been in Gettysburg, however. Um, 20, 28 years of those 32 in Gettysburg. After a stint at Kings Mountain, then another stint at Fort Laramie, then another stint uh, at the uh, Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, and uh, then I came to Gettysburg. So, about 32 long before I got to the park. I know it's, it's typical that you get a lot of applications for positions, especially ones like Gettysburg. And uh, of the 78 applications, when I applied for the job here, they took me, and they've been regretting it ever since. <laughs> good questions. I, I try to answer, uh, uh, and many of them I can answer, but some of the ones that uh, are very detailed, like the little round top situation, uh, it's best held by somebody that knows a lot more about it. Anybody have any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm not trying to tell. Uh, does, the, uh, does the battlefield continue to either gather or solicit artifacts? Is there like a how do you how do you work that? Is it basically donations, or would you buy something if it's rare enough? Mm -hmm. or how does that work? Well, we we can acquire Gettysburg related right. artifacts or ones that uh, the, some of something to do with a participant here. Uh, we can purchase them thanks to our partner, the Gettysburg Foundation, who gives us some money to purchase certain items. A few years ago, we purchased using. Uh, Gettysburg Foundation money, uh, we uh, purchased a beautiful Sharps rifle uh, by a major in the Verdan Sharpshooters and his log book. And uh, that went up for sale uh, at auction up in Massachusetts. And we were able to acquire that through, through open bidding, which was without the Gettysburg Foundation money, <coughs> park service funds wouldn't be there. So, yeah, and then of course donations, depend on what they are. Uh, had uh, a gentleman come in a few uh, years ago, brought in a sword, and uh, wanted me to identify it, and then after I identified it, he wanted to <coughs> donate it to the park. And I'm not, <coughs> making fun of anyone, but it was a early 20th century theatrical sword. <laughs> and it was used in some play or something. And, and I told him, I said, well, very nice of you, but we wouldn't be interested in that particular item to donate. <laughs> but, uh, some people, they, you know, they come in, they have this marvelous thing, and it might be marvelous, but for our collection, it it really doesn't fit. Yes. Uh, well, I was volunteering at Double Stand for the Sesquicentennial, etc. The gentleman showed up with uh, a sword that belonged to Lieutenant Commander Cummings. Cummings, twenty twenty four. Okay. Mm -hmm. The one that was um, damaged when he was hit by the piece of cat. Okay. No, but I know they, I know people, they told me it was going to be there. Yeah, now those particular items, if someone was willing to donate, yeah, those are particularly nice identified Gettysburg items, and I'm sure Greg would be interested in something like right, that right, as a donation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> especially when it's damaged here, yeah, swords, swords, of, but yeah, um, 
once in a while we get some folks that want to donate something and uh, uh, old photographs of Gettysburg and things like that. And we just, you know, don't have the space or the inclination to take everything. You can't take just everything. Yes, sir. Um, back to that Sharps rifle. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me that's stuck in the basement so nobody can see it. It's stuck in the basement. Yes. You'll be able to see it maybe next year when we bring I mean, it out. If somebody else bought it and put it on display, wouldn't that be better? Um, we can discuss that after the program. I'll let you know. Like I said, they've been regretting hiring me ever since because I usually want to give a direct answer, but right now I'm going to refer to them a little later. So. I'll tell you a little bit more of my opinions about that. But it's in the collection, it's safe, it's going to be preserved, so is the log book. Politics at Gettysburg. It's like politics nationwide. You kind of want to avoid most of it, at least I do. At this stage in my career, so. See, there's a lot of empty spots in the middle there. <clears throat> no uh, questions about food in the auditorium, huh? Like, why can't we bring in some popcorn? <laughs> now, there I would like. Yes, I do, and I'll bring one of those out maybe next year or the following year. It's called the Blakesley Cartridge Box for the Spencer Repeating Rifle or Carby. It holds uh, 10 tubes preloaded, it's kind of like a speed loader, and those boxes are like hen's teeth. I mean, and they're so cool. We have two of them in our collection. Something as mundane as a Blakely cartridge box, that's my favorite item. But then, of course, my favorite rifle, of course, is the Spencer rifle, so they go hand in hand. But what a, uh, having two in any collection. Uh, matter of fact, a number of years ago, uh, somebody out there, some mom and pop production, was reproducing them. And now the reproductions of the Blakely cartridge box, and the reproductions were fairly decent for the original, uh, is over $2,500. So uh, the last uh, Blakely cartridge box I saw that come up on auction, original, and nice shape, even had the strap, carrying strap, uh, sold for $15,000. That's not why I like them, but it helps. <laughs> we have two in our collection. That, that's my favorite. Although, all these items here are just marvelous. I, it's kind of hard to just pick one, but yeah, probably the Blake's Lee. <laughs> Well, before we begin, here I'd like to welcome to our uh, winter lecture series. My name is Tom Holbrook. I'm a ranger here at Gettysburg. That's fairly obvious to everyone. And for the next hour, we're going to take a step back into our museum collection. And uh, we have brought out a few items here from the collection that we can see every day. And um, the program is entitled, If These Things Could Talk. So, we're going to uh, take a romp through the collection today and uh, give you some background on the items that we brought back, uh, brought out here today. And uh, hopefully at the conclusion of the program, you'll be spurred to maybe uh, do your own romp through museums around the country and here at Gettysburg as well. Also, before we would uh, begin, 
Uh, we're doing this, I believe, live streaming, Matt, is that no, it? Live streaming, of course. Well, if, if Matt, do you mind coming up and explaining mm -hmm. what's going on? Sure. This is Matt, he's filming us. No, nope. not for, it's just audio. Just audio. He's going to be explaining where you can get that. Yeah. If you're interested in listening to the lectures from the whole season so far all the way through the end, uh, just go to addressinggettysburg.com and you can find them through there. And that's it. Thank okay. you. Yeah, uh, in the past they've been on YouTube. I don't know what we're going to do with that. Uh, I, he's been doing videos back there. Do you put them on YouTube? Yeah. So, yeah, so they will eventually be on YouTube and all that. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's begin. Um, last few years I've always uh, begin with reciting a, uh, a poem that one of our staff people have written. His name is Burt Barnett. And he wrote this poem especially for If These Things Could Talk. And it goes like something like this. Oh, if all these things could talk. But what tales from their time would they tell? Bound together as these hallowed fields wield their incomprehensible spell. Sometimes Bird in his poetry is a little cryptic, so follow along with me. <laughs> Through the relics remain among us, all employed in those old savage ways, for the tribes of the nation contested with the curse of this crimson spewn haze. We will begin with our first artifact. It belongs to a major general by the name of John Sedgwick. Now, most of you are familiar with John Sedgwick. Very important uh, uh, commander here of the Sixth Corps, the Reserve Corps of the Federal Army here at Gettysburg. Uh, John Sedgwick was born in Litchfield, Connecticut, as you can see here. He attended West Point, uh, graduated 24th in the class of 50. There was point back then was smaller, of course. They're not up to, now they're up to, what, four or 500 graduates and so forth a year. Commissioned second lieutenant in the U.S. artillery, so he's an old artilleryman, served in those uh, Seminole Wars and received two brevets for promotion during the war with Mexico. Uh, Cherubusco, uh, Contreras, and I believe, um, oh, what other one was he in? <coughs> Slipped my mind, but maybe for the, Chipotepec, there you go. I get mad at myself, all I have to do is read the screen. What a moron I am. Um, <laughs> he served in the U.S. Army in Kansas. He fought against the, uh, the Indians out there, the native tribes. And of course, uh, he was part of the big Utah uh, expedition up in 1857, headed by Albert Sidney Johnson, Brigadier General, later become Confederate General, dying at Shiloh. Uh, promoted to Brigadier General in 1861, and he served all the major campaigns of the Army of the Potomac. And uh, in 1863, he took command of the Sixth Corps here at Gettysburg. Now, John Sedgwick being placed in the reserve corps of the Federal Army, that's kind of a misnomer for a lot of people. You think being held in reserve, you're not going to see a lot of action. Uh, but the contrary, in the American Civil War, the Sixth Corps was involved in every major campaign and heavily, heavily engaged here at Gettysburg. On July 2nd, 1863, uh, most of the uh, Sixth Corps was coming up the roads from the south. They came into the battle uh, early on the, the second, and those men of the Sixth Corps under John Sedgwick were sent right out of the battle. Some were sent over to Culp's Hill to help sp uh, spell the Confederate tide, you know, that was rolling over Culp's Hill at that time. And they also were sent down by the Round Tops and out to support the Third Corps. So. Those units of the Sixth Corps that came right up into battle, they were sent right out to the sound of the guns. Um, 
at the Battle of Chancellorsville, or a Battle of Spotsylvania on May 9th, the general, General Sedgwick, was, di was directing the placement of artillery. And he was watching the skirmishers, and he got very upset about the skirmishers because the Confederate sharpshooters were uh, shooting at them. And, and he actually had something to say about that. And if you give me a minute here, I'll read what the eyewitnesses said about that event. At the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, May 9th, 1864, with, 1864, with his Sixth Corps probing the skirmish lines ahead of the left flank of the Confederate defenses, he was directing artillery in placements, being an old artilleryman. Confederate sharpshooters were about a thousand yards away, and their shots caused many members of his staff and artillery to duck for cover. Sedgwick rode in the open and was quoted as saying, What? Men dodging this way for single bullets? What will you do when they open fire along the whole line? I was ashamed as men continued to flinch, and he repeated, I am ashamed of you dodging that way. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. Seconds later, General Sedgwick fell forward with a bullet hole below his left eye and died at the battle. Kind of a ironic, one of the most ironic stories of the American Civil War. Uh, there's many, many other stories like that as well. Imagine that, you know, couldn't hit a elephant at this distance, and then second later, uh, a Confederate uh, sharpshooter, mini ball, ended his life. But what we have for you here is a memento or a reminder of General John Sedgwick, and that's his Major General Officer Sash. Now, the Sash. It was very important, especially in 19th century armies, and uh, it was a symbol of rank. It was also worn uh, by uh, officers of all rank. They have different colors, whichever branch of service. Uh, they were usually a private purchase item, and uh, they could get kind of expensive back then. Uh, for a general officer, of course, that would be a gold-colored sash. Now, the time has kind of washed it out and it looks a little, uh, little, little more white, but that's a gold sash. Of course, uh, depending on what branch and what, uh, what level of officer you were, the different colors of sashes. Officers of the day had different sashes, and they were symbols of rank. Um, by the turn of the century, sashes in the, uh, for symbols of rank kind of went out of favor in the U.S. Army, the U.S. military, although they continue to wear them in other nations around the world, and I think even today there are some nations that still you will find um, the sash with the waist belt, usually on a dress uniform of some kind. This is not a combat piece of uh, ornamentation, however, uh, because of course sashes in combat um, make doing your job very difficult. So they were usually left behind on the wagon trains of the generals and and major officers and so forth. But this, uh, I always said, if this sash could speak, it would speak of the service of General Sedgwick, which usually goes kind of falls to the wayside, especially when you're dealing with the amount of generals here at Gettysburg, you know, the General Sickles and all the controversy around him. Sedgwick so kind of gets lost in that shuffle. Uh, the General Hancock's Hancock the Superb, uh, that's kind of lost, uh, Sedgwick's story is kind of lost in that. Did his job, did it very well, and uh, 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 
as a general, uh, major general in the Federal Army, um, uh, the sash would, in my opinion, speaks to that commitment and that that service that he um, that he exhibited until uh, up until uh, May 9th when he was killed in Spotsylvania. A lot of people always question about, well, you know, that could be an expensive item. How could officers afford things like that? Well, uh, it's the rank, uh, the rank and pay of the American Civil War soldier is pretty well documented. You know, the privates, you were starting out at $13 a month if you're in the North, and then in 1864 they gave you a big raise, and, uh, not steam driven, they were all sewn, you know, by the old pedal machine, and they would sew those, uh, that pattern of the uniform. Uh, they would, hundreds of people would be working in these production factories for clothing in the North. And uh, part of the uh, construction of the uniform, there would always be some extra little lint or something that fell on the floor. Uh, in the textile industry, a unused little piece of wool or cloth uh, is called shod. And they nicknamed it Shad. Now Shad is actually a derivative from a name from a uh, from a, uh, a, a wool uh, short staple wool uh, that's made for carded wool that's made for like uniforms and things like that. And they would at the end of the day have all this Shad around the floor, and they would hire someone to come and they would sweep up the Shad because it was. No good for anything. It wasn't used. And then they would burn it in the, one of the furnaces or get rid of it. Well, as the war progressed, some of these war profiteer factories thought, hey, we're wasting all this shod, this wool too, on, on uh, throwing it into the fire, getting rid of it. So what they would do, some of them, they would collect that shod, they would mix it in with some kind of glue, and then they'd press out a form, and then they would cut out the uniform. And the soldiers who were issued late in the war, those uniforms that were made of shod, that were loosely held together by, by some type of glue material, they said when it, when it got wet or it rained, it would fall apart. Literally, the seams would come out, it would literally fall apart. And so the soldiers, especially those that had the ties to the textile industry, started calling that clothes, those uniforms that fell apart, made of shod, shoddy merchandise. So that kind of, uh, um, that probably term existed before the American Civil War, but it became very popular, especially with the factories that made those clothes, wanted to prof profit uh, on the war and profit off the, the backs of soldiers. This uniform in particular is not of shoddy construction. It's lasted all these years. We got the stamping in it, of course, uh, all the government stamps, the specs on the uniform, where it was made, and so forth. And does anyone have any questions I should ask? Anyone questions about the great code and maybe the story, other stories you could tell, maybe of the mounted troops of, of production. And that those production numbers are staggering. Um, one particular historian I, I got a hold of a few years ago estimated that of the 2.9 million soldiers north and south that fought in the American Civil War, almost 3 million, the North alone produced something like 1.8 to 2.5 million sets of uniforms, pants, fatigue jackets, uh, the blouses, the gray coats upwards to 2.5 million. My story, a little bit about Fort Laramie working out there, uh, they were still 
dressing in Civil War made uniforms uh, into the 1890s uh, in the U.S. Army. They had that much left over. Matter of fact, they were still dressing some of the National Guards after the turn of the last century, almost up to World War I. So there was so much surplus left over. But uh, that shows the, you know, the power of American production, be that in the North. Questions? Yes, sir. Were there, earlier in the war, were there state variations on those jackets, like the New York shell jacket? Yes. Um, it depends on the government contracts. Some had state contracts with the, uh, with the factories that produced them. So state specs, government specs, they were... This subject, although being fascinating, is overwhelming. There's no one can really get to the bottom of, of the level of production because the, for the Ordnance Department, all individual. You'd have to go through every single company, every single regiment in the Federal Army, out west, in the east, and a lot of them didn't do that, didn't write it down. So a general estimate, I can't give you how many were state contracts or how many were federal contracts. All I can say is that of that approximately 1,900, 500 factories, nearly 2,000 were producing clothing in just the north. So, yeah, it's not, not an exact science in the American Civil War. It's like the casualties at Gettysburg. Some were, be, some were between seven to 10,000 men killed outright. No one, if someone tells you exactly there were, you know, 8,350, that's suspect because that information isn't there. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the, jet, the coat, I should say, uh, that's similar to the coat that they use at, at West Point to this day? Similar, yeah. Very similar. The, uh, the overcoat or gray coat, uh, the styles kind of change. A lot of them are double-breasted and different material, of course, from not, now like rayon and all those nice things that last forever. But yeah, it's uh, similar to the style. Yes, sir. What was the largest state or area for factories that produced these gray coats? I do have some information on that. There were two that equally about the same of those roughly 2,000. Uh, there were something like 50 in Connecticut and another 65 or so estimate in New York State. So New York and Connecticut produced the most uniforms for the Federal Army. And then, only for the Union side, right? Yes. Now, the Confederates, they had their own system and <clears throat> means of production, but uh, they had a whole lot less factories. Um, I couldn't give you a number on how many, uh, but I'm certainly there were 1,900, uh, 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 1,900 factories in the South. Um, a lot of those uh, factories in the South were located, I do know that manufactured clothing in Atlanta, around Atlanta in Georgia, because that's where like a lot of the big mills were, textile mills. But that's all I can give you. And that, that estimate for New York and Connecticut, now that's an estimate, because people in the know have told me anywhere between 25 to 65, or you know, you get a, you get the picture. There was a lot. That's really anyone production numbers in clothing, production numbers in weapons, rifles, uh, carbines, <coughs> artillery pieces. They're a little more of an exact science, but uniforms. As this gentleman pointed out, there were state, there were federal. Uh, it's just, you know, government wants to track the weapons, not so much a, you know, a fatigue jacket. Okay, let's uh, go on to our next <laughs> item.
Uh, the next item uh, is uh, quite fascinating. Actually, we have two items for, uh, for John Ro Robinson. Uh, John Robinson uh, was born in uh, Binghamton, New York in 1817. He was um, a failure at West Point, as it says here. He was dismissed for violating regulations. Now, I did some research on what violations did he, he, he violate, and I couldn't find much. There wasn't much about that. But uh, uh, even though it kind of came up empty-handed, he did violate the regulations of West Point, so he was uh, dismissed. However, he enlisted in the Army uh, probably not much more than uh, you know three years later and was commissioned second lieutenant. Uh, in the 5th Infantry. Now it's very typical, a lot of West Point grads or West Pointers that go to attend the academy, uh, you know, there's high standards and, you know, there's a very competitive environment and, uh, you know, it's not for everyone, and, but you still want to serve and like John Robinson, you go into the Army and you kind of make your way up the ladder that way. Um, in the open days of the American Civil War, found himself at Fort McHenry. Um, where he negotiated with pro-Southern uh, parties to leave the fort and its garrison alone until it could be secured by additional federal troops, which is quite a feat. That shows he was quite a, quite a politician. He had a way with speaking. Elected Colonel of the 1st Michigan Infantry in 1861, he was promoted to Brigadier General and commanded a division uh, within a year, so he was promoted. Uh, uh, people, uh, his contemporaries said he was a very brave, brave man. He was very calculating and very brave. He could also inspire his troops. That's what uh, some of his contemporaries said. He also, like General, General Sedgwick, uh, he uh, received a severe wound at Spotsylvania Courthouse in 1864, and then he was, of course, removed from field command. Um, Robinson uh, was one of the, in the first corps. Was one of the first uh, uh, brigade Your commanders. Has lost connection to the internet. Was one of the first again. commanders on the field here on July 1st. Uh, his uh, brigade fought up there uh, on the first day of battle and helped stem the tide and buy time uh, for the main body of the uh, First Corps uh, to come up onto the field. So after the cavalry kind of went out and John Buford pulled back, the first people to arrive was John Robinson and, and his brigade, and they fought very gallantly against tremendous Confederate attacks. And uh, uh, received uh, uh, here at Gettysburg, received a uh, uh, citation, back then it was common, a citation from Congress, not a medal of any kind, but a citation from Congress of his gallantry here at Gettysburg. So uh, what we have for you today is actually his commission, not only for Major General, but you can see his commission for Brigadier General. Now, remember the Brigadier's pay was about 315 a month, where a Major General was about $478 a month. But the commission doesn't state numbers like that in what your pay is. It's signed by the President of the United States, and this commission uh, in the uh, U.S. Army uh, could be of two types. One is a temporary rank called the brevet, and then the other is your permanent rank uh, of uh, uh, if you're a general officer. For example, um, a lot of people, uh, uh, you take General Custer, George Armstrong Custer, all of his promotions whether it was Brigadier General of Volunteers, Brigadier General of the U.S. Army, Major General of Volunteers, or Major General U.S. Army, were all brevet ranks. That's a temporary rank. That it's not designed to last your whole lifetime. You don't get the pay associated uh, only during that time that you serve under the brevet. Usually what happens is a brevet rank is given when you have to command a lot of troops if you're a general officer. 
After the war, when the army starts cutting back, they don't have a lot of troops compared to when they fought the American Civil War. Those brevet ranks expire, and you go back to your linear rank. Custer, it just so happened to have a linear rank as a captain. And then, of course, he applied for uh, lieutenant colonel of the newly found uh, 7th U.S. Uh, Cavalry, uh, I believe, in 1866. So, yeah, the brevet ranks are kind of very difficult to kind of understand, and they were given out uh, by a thankful nation and a thankful Congress and a thankful president at the end of the war. A lot of brevet commands were issued, especially in general, the general ranks, on uh, uh, March 13th, 1864. Five, figuring the war's coming to an end, we're going to reward these people that had served with a temporary promotion and the pay that goes with it. Also about the brevet rank, once you've been breveted, you can keep that title the rest of your life. That's why General, or that's why Captain Custer, Lieutenant Colonel Custer, linear rank in the U.S. Army, had a brevet major general rank in the U.S. Army, so as a courtesy, he would be addressed as general. If you ever read the reports about, that's confusing with brevet ranks, the reports uh, firsthand about the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876, oh my gosh, they call each other by their brevet. George Custer called the general, General Custer. And then they, call, then they refer to another Custer that was there, his brother, as Colonel Custer. And then there's Brigadier General Reno and all, you know, Colonel Benteen. They're going by their, their, uh, their temporary ranks as you, know, as, as, as you should, as a, as a courtesy. And it's very confusing because you don't know if they're talking about Colonel Custer, Lieutenant Colonel Custer, or his brother, who happened to be captain at the time, his <laughs> linear rank in the service. So it can get kind of confusing. Uh, a lot of people uh, do not get an opportunity to see these. We're very blessed today because we get to see an actual commission. Uh, these are usually, you know, made of a uh, of a. Uh, a cheap parchment, basically, and they disintegrate. Paper items usually disintegrate over time unless they're stored. And a lot of these were, you know, in family, you know, especially like a Robinson's family. Uh, they were, you know, placed in a drawer or something, and, you know, they didn't get the proper climate controls that we have today. And a lot of paper stuff just doesn't exist. So a lot of these commissions, even by some of the fam famous generals we've heard of, don't exist anymore. So if this could talk, it would not only talk about all the confusion all after the war of all those brevet ranks, it could also talk about the pay of the generals compared to the privates. And also, this one specific, uh, specifically talks about John C. Robinson, a good commander, good commander, uh, severely wounded, survived the war, and like General Sedgwick, who happened to die at that same battle of Spotsylvania, um, was, was acknowledged by a very thankful um, a nation. Not on display today is the document case. I didn't see it up there unless I dropped it off the cart, bringing it up the hall, which I hope I didn't do. <laughs> little story about uh, Robinson here. Uh, you can read a little bit about uh, his action on July 1st. Uh, very instrumental in helping hold the town of Gettysburg, hold it for the rest of the First Corps to come up. Anyone have any questions about those brevet ranks? Any questions about those? It gets confusing. Yes? So you go back to your linear rank and lose the pay, but you can keep the title, so without just the... That's right. So yeah, I'm general I'm supposed to run not, but just use OK. So yeah. Yeah, his, his rank at the time, 
1866 uh, till the day he he died at the Little Bighorn was killed uh, was Lieutenant Colonel. That's his pay. That's his pay. Um, but you get to keep the honorary title as long as you know general. And that's why the accounts of that battle, when the participants, they're talking about Colonel so and so, Colonel this, Captain here, and you know Major so and so, and he said, well, they were, you know, everyone's heard of Captain Benteen. Why are they calling him a colonel? Ah, that's that rabbit colonel rank guy. Yeah, yeah. It does get confusing. And it's just, it's, it, people say it's an empty title. But uh, for these men, it's not an empty title. They commanded troops. Uh, and another interesting thing that I particularly saw at Fort Laramie was that um, we have set up out there uh, the officers' quarters and the bachelor officers' quarters, and we've decorated uh, part of the old photographs of the fort. And you, you you walk through some of those those rooms, and you can see photographs, old you know lithographs of Lincoln, of battle scenes like Shiloh or Gettysburg, and then a sword, you know, uh, hanging on the wall. This meant a lot to these men, uh, especially the officers who led men, large bodies of men, fighting for the Union, to save the Union. And a few years later, they were out policing the plains, fighting against the native tribes, and there's no glory in that. And so I could imagine those men who had led huge armies, like a General Custer, Huge men in combat, fighting, all enthused to, uh, to you know, to put down this rebellion, you know, from the south. And then a few years later, at a drop in rank in the pay, he goes back to their linear rank. They're in charge of 90 men who were going on patrol out in the on the deserts of Fort Laramie. You can see why there was a lot of a uh, uh, lot of officers not too happy. The post-war army, who up until oh, up until the 1890s, uh, was not a very well-defined. They didn't have a well-defined mission. They, uh, a lot of their hearts weren't in it. The officers, you know, lost those brevet the brevet pay and spent years in the same rank of a captain where a few years before they were a major general or a general, you know, at Gettysburg. So, yeah, you can see why that type of, uh, that type of disillusionment kind of cre crept into the Army from uh, starting, uh, you know, after the American Civil War. Yes, sir? So, so you mentioned Custer, yes, but, uh, you know, uh, John Gibbon ran into that problem too. Mm -hmm. But now, when you take guys like uh, Sh Sherman and Sheridan, Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, they were given brevet ranks in the Civil War, but then they were uh, uh, given actual ranks in the, they, their, in the regular army. Right. Uh, they were given brevets, but uh, most of their commissions were regular U.S. Army. Which, and, and that which, didn't happen that often. Like no, that. it didn't. Uh, Sherman, <coughs> Sheridan. Uh, there were a number of the ones that were stayed in the army, but they were the like Grant. You know, Grant, Grant's first commission was uh, uh, when he got into the officer's rank was by brevet, and then soon, a few years later, he was full general of the army, being paid as a three-star general, uh, and that three-star rank. Uh, would bring him about $758 a month. Plus, he probably is general of the army appointed in, in February 64. General of all the armies appointed by Lincoln probably gave him a little bonus. Yeah. So those regular soldiers, those regular ranks, uh, the, uh, the president, the Congress, put those regular ranks right on those guys right now. I mean, people like Sheridan and Sherman uh, a few others, but uh, for the uh, the average, say West Pointer, uh, the average was mostly by brevet, and uh, 
you know, their time in grade and time in service and all that counts towards their linear rank. And they didn't have that much, so they were went down to captaincy and things like that. Okay, very good discussion. The next, thinking of general officers, we seem to be that's a focus today. We have uh, uh, an item from Henry Halleck. Now, Henry Halleck is a very interesting character. Uh, now, uh, if you were to ask probably the typical Southern soldier who Harry, Henry Halleck was, they would have no idea. Consequently, if you'd ask the typical uh, Union soldier, they'd have no idea who Henry Halleck was. And I'll explain that in a minute. He was a veteran of the war with Mexico. Of course, he's a trained West Pointer. And he served as chief of staff to Abraham Lincoln and uh, later to Andrew Johnson during the American Civil War. Now, they didn't have the Joint Chiefs of Staff like we have, where different branches are represented, to, they each have an equal say, and so forth, to direct the president. President Lincoln needed someone that could organize and report to him all facets of the war. We're fighting in the East, we're fighting in the West, we're fighting in the Trans-Mississippi West. You have to supply the troops. You have to get the ordnance departments up and running. You have to report on all facets of the war, um, except you know the finances, so so forth. Um, other cabinet members will do that. So this is a tremendous, tremendous um, uh, undertaking for an officer to be selected to be in Washington D.C. And, and basically organize, and his staff organized the war. Of course, many of you know that in the early facets of the war, the early days of the war, President Abraham Lincoln uh, was, was not only listening to Henry Halleck, but he was listening to a lot of other people, including politicians, who were telling him what he had to do to win the war. You know, it's on to Richmond. Yeah, catch you that, and we're done. Oh, no, blockade, blockade that south and we'll starve them to death. You know, there were so many different um, people and um, Henry Halleck, in one of his jobs was to make sure that these people were even either had or didn't have access to Abraham Lincoln on the military matters. But, um, you know, there were so many different policies and of course, uh, uh, my own opinion is President Lincoln looked, looked, looked to all those different policies at the end of the war. Never happened before. Is you know, the, the North versus South is war between the states. He didn't know how to get a handle on it. And then, in February of 1864, he took the advice of a very famous commander coming out of the West. When asked how he beats the the uh, the Confederates at every turn, General Grant turns to Abraham Lincoln and says, same way how we're going to end this war. What you do is you grab on to those armies like a bulldog. Grab on to those southern people's necks like a bulldog. Drive them into the ground. And when they're groveling at your feet, you lift them up in the image you want them to be. Well, President Lincoln thought that was very harsh. These are fellow Americans. <clears throat> General Grant, who studied wars of revolutions and civil wars, felt that that was the only way you could effectively beat the South and keep them um, down until you were able to lift them up so they can return and be productive Americans again. Well, he listened to General Grant because he was out of options. And that policy of grabbing on like a bulldog to the throats of the South, drive them into the ground, ruin them psychologically, ruin them militarily, economically, socially, that allowed after the war, after a lot of years of contention, to finally you know, we don't have a, we don't have a civil war. Those southern folks were lifted up 
and they became like my home state right there and uh, productive so when you listen to one particular person's philosophy how you end this war uh, uh, satisfactory uh, like uh, you know when Lincoln wanted to uh, then uh, I think General Grant's his concept of how you do it but that was not the norm that was not the norm but he listened to Grant and that's what I believe uh, uh, won the actual war and allowed the South to, to be brought back up after. Although Henry Halleck, though, he was uh, maybe not, not the philosophy. He had the, uh, the, uh, uh, the job of just running the War Department, which is very difficult to do. Uh, he also had Edward Stanton head to, and, and uh, at times uh, Edward Stanton and Henry Halleck would clash on certain <clears throat> things, but, but being subordinate, he was able to carry on and do his job. Um, after the war, he was uh, thought of highly, highly up and was given a very plum assignment out to the Division of the Pacific in California. He wasn't sent to the Division of the Platte or the Division of uh, Texas where there was a lot of upheaval. He was sent to a very plum job where he was uh, able to organize and then later on um, the Military District of the South. Now those military districts after the American Civil War the Military District of the South, that was Reconstruction, and uh, Henry Halleck was, was, according to some of his colleagues, was at odds on what he, he thought Reconstruction should be. Uh, the Republicans controlling the House of Representatives and the Senate, they wanted to punish the South, the black Republicans, they called them, just, just keep those Southern people down. But of course, Henry Halleck was more to the the Abraham Lincoln, the U.S. Grants. Once they are down, then you gently lift them up into the image you want them to be. Um, where he ran into a little bit of problems, but as a commander and a leader of an army, head of basically the head of the War Department, understand the contributions Henry Halleck made um, helped uh, went a long way, a long way in. Uh, in winning the war for the North. Imagine all they had to organize. It's just terrible. But most Union soldiers never heard of them. <laughs> they haven't, usually most of them haven't heard over their, their colonel of their regiment. And of course, most Southerners, to Henry Halleck, he was nothing. He was, he was somebody that works, you know, for the Yankee War Department. But his contributions were great. We have his watch that was presented to him in 1867 from the staff when he was working during the American Civil War uh, in the War Department. Uh, and it's a pretty expensive watch, according to uh, our curator, uh, uh, Greg Goodell. He spent some time in researching some of the, the timepieces. And it's engraved uh, to Henry Halleck by the staff officers. Uh, presented to him in 1867 for the for the time and effort that he put in uh, in those uh, four years of, of war. Uh, the watch could speak. Uh, it's not running presently, but if it could run and speak, it would talk about someone who, without any fanfare, without any re real recognition, labored in the War Department, but was instrumental in winning the war for the Union Army. What a what a big job. Any questions? Henry Halleck. You have a misprint, don't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> Let me point out. <laughs> 1967, 1867 is the correct date. I take that back about John Heiser. <laughs> what did I just do? Okay. All right. Any other questions? Henry Halleck's watch. have another sword. There's a problem though. 
and I'll explain in just a moment. But we'll go over uh, uh, Orlando Smith. He was the colonel of the, uh, the 73rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Uh, many of you remember the Ohio 73rd, their monument sits on the corner of the National Soldier Cemetery on the confluences of the Taneytown Road and Steinware Avenue. And uh, there, uh, along with Orlando Smith, or Orland Smith, I should say, not Orlando, Orland Smith, um, there was another very famous private in that regiment. Uh, not at the time, but now looking back, uh, a gentleman by the name of George Nixon. Uh, he was in Company G. And George Nixon uh, is buried in the National Soldier Cemetery. Uh, George Nixon was sent on, uh, on uh, night duty. He was going to do some uh, uh, um, posting out uh, skirmish. Yeah, it's kind of like a skirmish duty being posted after dark out in the open field, which is now Pickett's Charge. And that kind of duty is feared, picket duty. That's what it's called. Picket duty is feared by soldiers because uh, um, you're off, often far from your own lines, total darkness, keeping the listen out for the enemy so they don't sneak up to your lines. And men get very nervous and very often on picket duty, uh, they'll hear a noise, uh, they think it's the enemy, they'll pick up their rifle and take a pot shot. Nothing all to relieve the tension. Uh, soldiers uh, who've done picket duty and survived uh, felt themselves very, very fortunate. One soldier said about picket duty, if you do it long enough, and I quote, if you do it long enough, it's a short ticket to your coffin. <laughs> George Nixon was ordered to picket duty that evening of July 2nd, shortly after the uh, 73rd arrived on the federal line. And uh, he picked up his rifle, went all by himself, across the uh, Taytown Road, across the Emmitsburg Road, and in the darkness on July 2nd, 1863, stood a post. About the same time, a Confederate soldier, we have no idea what his name was, arrived near the spot of, of, of George Nixon in that open field. That Confederate soldier, very nervous, fearful of picket duty, heard a sound, picked up his rifle, took a pot shot at that sound, and wounded George Nixon right here in the hip. Now there's an artery that runs down the inside of our leg. It's called the femoral artery. Uh, we all know what happens if a bullet were to just nick that femoral artery. You're far from any help. What would happen to you? Well, the surgeons uh, that, uh, that operated on George uh, did not mention the femoral artery, but they did know they did mention that they could not stop the bleeding of, of George Nixon, and George Nixon bled to death in a Union Field Hospital 12 days after his wounds. 12 days bleeding to death. Just a horrible story. But one that speaks to the 73rd and their Colonel Orlin Smith. Tenacious, they said. Very tenacious commander. Very well respected. We have his sword. And this is a German-made combat sword. This isn't one of the swords we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. This isn't a presentation sword. This is one that was, was carried by him in battle. And it even displays the iron scabbard that was dented by a bullet that he received that saved his life, probably, at Missionary Ridge. And the sword today, this model 1850 foot officer's sword made in Germany, a lot of imported rifles and swords, of course. American manufacturing, those 119,500 factories in the north couldn't make, make everything. Uh, so, uh, of course, they went overseas to buy a lot of the swords, a lot of the weapons. Um, Britain provided arms dealer of the world at the time, provided a lot of, of weaponry, and the Germans provided a lot of, of these swords. Uh, problem is, today we are not going to see this sword. Now people say, why do you even talk about it? Because you don't have it out on display. It is now presently down in the Harper's Ferry Restoration Center and going through some restoration. Now, 
a little bit different restorations done on a coat or cloth or paper. Uh, more hard items, so to speak, like a sword and weapons. Uh, it's probably giving uh, a coat of some type of curatorial wax or something so it won't rust or anything like that. Here at the Gettysburg Collection downstairs, very little need. Uh, not many of our things go to Harper's Ferry, so there must have been a real reason there was something that the uh, that Greg and the uh, conservators thought that they needed to take care of. And that's down there presently, but believe me, I'll bring her back maybe next year. We can see it out here. <laughs> Speaks to uh, Orland Smith, carried it in combat. It was a combat sword. Uh, only less than 1% of all wounds uh, in the American Civil War were caused by bayonets and swords. It was more an ornamental thing. In this particular instance, being in its scabbard saved the colonel's life. And then we have another item that this is, uh, oh, any questions about Orland? It'll be, it'll be here next year. <laughs> we have something that this, to me, I brought out uh, on occasion in the past a few years ago, and that is a housewife uh, by uh, Private John Doerr. Yeah, John Doerr uh, was uh, 28 years old. He was a farmer from, uh, from Massachusetts, and he enlisted quite early in the war. He enlisted in, in Company D of the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry. The 2nd Massachusetts was a fighting regiment in the Federal Army of the Potomac. They saw action in Northern Virginia, Antietam. They fought at Chancellorsville. Um, and on July 3rd, 1863, the 2nd Mass, Massachusetts went into battle once more. Now, on July 2nd, the day before, uh, the uh, Federal Army wanted to extend the line a little bit down by the Spangler Spring. You had McDougal's Brigade up there, and then this, the spring itself, which was a big, wide, like, pond. They wanted to extend the line a little bit. So they sent uh, uh, Silas Corgrove and his brigade out there. Uh, the lead regiment, of course, was the 2nd Massachusetts, and they found that Confederate soldiers were in the trenches, where they had trenched, just uh, would be south of Spangler Spring. So they immediately charged, got them out of the trenches, send them back across the Spangler Meadow, and they stood, they stood pat for a while. Well, the second Massachusetts um, was needed that afternoon of July 2nd. So they were packed up in Cold Grove, gave the order for them to head to the Round Tops. Now, you, you know, all studied the Battle of Gettysburg. There was a constant movement through Powers Hill of all these troops going back and forth. They get over to the, the right flank. They're recalled over to the left flank. Put inside, you know, the, the, the federal line. Oh, it's just, it's, a, it's quite a operation, troops passing, so to speak, all day long. Well, they got over just to the round tops. Finally, by the afternoon, that area's been secured, uh, thanks to, uh, you know, little round top holding out and uh, uh, federal artillery and stemming the tide and, Longstreet's attack finally petered out, and so they were sent back over. So they went back over to Spangler Spring, and they found that by the, that evening, the Confederates had come back to those trenches that they, got, that they just drove them out that afternoon. So they fought a big battle, and they took over McAllister Hill, where their monument, near their, where their monument is today. And they held down the line. Well, as the story goes, uh, uh, extra Billy Smith Confederates and so forth, and the old Stonewall Brigade, uh, they were uh, ordered to go around Spangler Spring and, and attack through Spangler Meadow, McDougal's Brigade, it's up on the hill. And when they were attacking McDougal's Brigade, Thomas Ruger, the division commander, told Silas Colgrove to get his brigade and hit their flank and attack them, charge them. Well, they're overwhelmed. They're over, outnumbered tremendously by, by two large Confederate uh, brigades. And uh, 
the uh, Thomas Ruger passed the order on to Silas Corgrove, and Colgrove passed it on to Colonel Mudge, who was in Colonel of the Second Massachusetts, the League Regiment, to attack. Well, Mudge utters the famous words to his men. I know it's murder, but it's of the order we've been given. He knew that a lot of his men wouldn't make it, including John Durer. They charged along with uh, the uh, 27th Indiana, and they went down, charged, stemmed the Confederate attack, but they lost a large percentage of their men. I had to go check and see how many men were lost in that attack. Made the second, well, you got it right here, 137 officers and men in the charge. But uh, uh, <coughs> left behind on the battlefield and later picked up by a resident in Gettysburg was the housewife, as you can come up here and see, of John Doerr, his name is in it. Now this is a real personal item because soldiers, uh, they usually didn't have a regimental tailor. Uh, some companies would have someone that for a few extra bucks would sew the men's clothes when they're on a break or something. But most men, it was their responsibility. And when you figure you're only given uh, a pair of shoes and uh, a uniform every year, you got to make this stuff last. And so uh, uh, a housewife brought from home, which contains needle and thread, and, th and patches and things went a long way for the soldiers to mend their own clothes. And uh, soldiers, it, it was a very personal item, kind of along with like a pocket Bible or something that they would carry. And it was very useful. Somewhere after the battle on uh, William McAllister's farm, which is part of that hill I was talking about, um, uh, they found. Uh, they found uh, near where he was buried uh, John Dewar's uh, uh, housewife. And I always said if this thing could talk, it, could, it would talk about the hundreds of thousands of men who sacrificed, not only at Gettysburg, but throughout the entire American Civil War. Sometimes when we come, we get you were kind of distance, we're what, 150 some, almost 160 years away, and we kind of forget sometimes that these were flesh and blood human beings like John Doerr, with a lot of the same hopes, the same dreams, the same fears we have today. And that, you know, the, the photographs, the, the items are, usually the only thing that remain of them. And uh, uh, we see them as young, vibrant, full of life. And uh, for nearly 620,000 of them, north and south, uh, they met a faith uh, as John Doerr. We'll never know, you know, exactly, you know, how he died. And, you know, question I always ask is if, if the housewife could talk, did he suffer? Was he crying out? Was it quick? Was it easy? Uh, it's 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 one of those questions that items like the housewife uh, pose a question, and, and it kind of sets you back and just remember that these were flesh and blood human beings with a lot of the same hopes and fears we have today, and they were young. They were young. Anyone have any any questions about the housewife and John Doerr, Second Mass? <coughs> Second Mass is a story here at Gettysburg. Uh, like uh, 26 North Carolina up on the first day uh, is a story of sacrifice. <coughs> they lost a lot of men, <coughs> probably twice as many women. Used a stencil and ink to stamp his name. Now, some of the sutlers probably you could buy that from a sutler. <coughs> he would have a stencil kit and you could.
could stamp, you could stamp your name in it. A lot of soldiers went to writing their name. A lot of men wrote their name in their jacket, not to identify them after their uh, their kill, but because uh, this is before the days of the dog tags, uh, just to keep the friends from stealing their clothes. <laughs> Uh, we have another unique item here, and I think this is uh, getting close to the end of our program. And uh, uh, this item is associated with, uh, with George Burling. George Burling is a very fascinating man, like all the men we were talking about. Uh, he was born in Burling County, New Jersey, and uh, he grew up uh, a coal merchant and a militia officer. Many pre-war militia. Uh, officers in the American Civil War. Almost every state had a militia, the predecessor to the National Guard, and they would drill and so forth. Uh, it was more of a social event, but as the war drew closer in the 1850s, uh, it became a little more serious, especially with the artillery up, uh, artillery militia up north. Uh, he was wounded at Second Bull Run. He was Colonel of the 6th New Jersey. Uh, he was wounded uh, quite a number of times uh, during the American Civil War. And by the time of Gettysburg, he was no longer Colonel of the 6th New Jersey. He'd been promoted. He was commander of the 2nd New Jersey Brigade, their monument down by the Weikert House. You can see it up on the hill there. Um, he was in the 3rd Corps. That should tell you something about the, the action that his brigade saw here in Gettysburg. Um, they were part of uh, Daniel Sickles' Third Corps. They went in uh, to various parts of the field to help. Uh, I think they were originally held in reserve and then went, were sent in uh, to help stem the tide of General Sickles uh, on July 2nd. Fought a good portion of that afternoon. Lost a lot of men. And uh, General uh, Burling was given a commission by Brevard uh, and uh, uh, served in the Army right up until 1864. Uh, according to some of the, uh, the reports I got, it was those wounds that he received at, at a couple of the battles that finally got to him. Uh, one of the contemporaries, one of the hospital people said that, uh, that uh, he, like Hancock, that was wounded here at Gettysburg, his wounds were really never healed. So uh, you can imagine he was, uh, he, uh, you know, was in poor health due to those wounds. But what we have is his non-regulation copy of an 1822 British Light Cavalry Sabre. But this is a misnomer. This is his battle sword. And uh, I was having a lot of praise for Jennifer uh, uh, Weaver, who brings these things out, helped organize and bring all these things out. She actually placed on the cart something even more spectacular than his battle sword. This is the one that he carried in combat. What we have for you today is his presentation sword given to him when he left the 6th New Jersey and was promoted to the 2nd uh, Brigade Command. So you get to see his, so that, that's, that's a, Way neat sword we have in his collection, but what you get to see by coming out after the program, his dress sword, his presentation sword, it's fabulous. Presentation swords were given usually by officers and, and the men of a command, given to their commander if they liked you or if you did well, if you were a good commander. And uh, presentation swords, um, men would pool their money, and you would go to uh, Horseman's in Philadelphia or one of the big military houses and have a customized sword. Uh, the, the battle sword that you carried in everyday combat was less ornate. It, it probably wasn't cost much. And it probably uh, uh, was just a symbol of rank, not used much, but it was used on the person in battle. I uh, saw a lot of com combat. But if this presentation sword was to tell the story, it would tell you of a man like uh, George Burley, who had been involved in military, been around men and people all his life, from a militia officer to the bravery he showed, uh, 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 
as uh, uh, a regimental uh, colonel right up to when he was uh, promoted to, uh, the, uh, to lead the uh, 2nd Jersey Brigade. <coughs> many, many men for North and South were just like uh, George Burley. <coughs> did a lot of service and did a lot of hard work and, and did it very well. Um, and uh, for that, they were presented with their presentation swords. We've ran over a lot of time. I do thank you for, uh, for uh, sticking around a little bit longer. Uh, much to my supervisor, Chris doesn't want us to go over, but I'm sorry, Chris, we went over again. <laughs> Any questions at all, right quick, and then I'll be sticking around a little bit. Come on down, take a look at these things up nice and close. I know the lights not good, but come on up here. We got all those items except Orland Smith sword. We don't have that. But thank you, folks.